Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. This is Susan Ryan. I'm the Senior Director for the Greenhouse Project. And before we get started today, I have just a few quick announcements. The first thing is to let you know that you are in listen-only mode. But if you have a question or a comment, I wanted to make you aware of the chat box feature, which is located on the right-hand side of your screen. Also wanted to let you know at the end of our broadcast, if you have questions, that's where you should put them, and we will save some time at the end of the webinar to take your questions. Also located on the right side of your screen, you'll see a little arrow that points to handouts. Those are handouts that you're able to uh, download at the end of our uh, presentation today. If for some reason you're not able to download them, please feel free to reach out to us, email us, and we'll make sure we get them to you directly. Today's session is being recorded, and we will send a link out to you the next few days so that you'll be able to listen and share it uh, broadly and widely. So thank you again for joining this insightful webinar and hoping that you'll join us uh, for all of our upcoming sessions. This year we are hosting four series, an overview series, one on workforce, the business case, and best life for those living with dementia. So visit our website to learn more information on the webinars, as well as information about greenhouse workshops that are offered across the country. I love greenhouse workshops because they give you an opportunity to get into a greenhouse home, to have what I call a seeing is believing experience. But in addition to that, it's a day long workshop that gives you the opportunity to do a deeper dive into understanding the model. Our next workshop is on April 18, and it's in uh, Loveland, Colorado, the beautiful homes there that are a part of the Loveland Housing Authority. You can register for that um, workshop on our website. So now, today's webinar, Workforce Challenges and Opportunities in the Field. This is the first in our series of webinars that are devoted to what I call a very hot topic of work, uh, workforce. And personally, I can't think of a better and more qualified person to kick off the series than Dr. Robin Stone, who is the Senior VP of Research at Leading Age. I have to tell you, I've heard Robin speak numerous times over the years, and every time that I've listened to Robin present, I have come back much richer and wiser. Um, most recently, I heard her present at a workforce symposium last September, and after hearing that presentation, I, I knew very quickly that Robin's insights were exactly what we wanted to kick off this series on workforce. Robin's got an impressive bio, but just to highlight a few things, she's a noted researcher and internationally recognized authority on long-term care and aging policy. She's held senior research and poly policy positions in both the U.S. government and uh, areas of the private, private sector. Her areas of expertise in the aging field are vast, and she's been published widely. So, Robin, I could go on and on about your qualifications for this topic, but I'd like to just turn it over to you. And um, it, again, anybody, if you've got questions, save them, put them in the chat box, and Robin will take them at the end. Fantastic. Thanks, Susan. Um, it's a great opportunity for me to, uh, to talk about the workforce challenges, but more importantly, I think the opportunities. And... Um, uh, as some of you may know, if any of you know me that are that are actually on this webinar, this is one of my bully pulpit areas. I am uh, very, very uh, highly committed to a quality, competent workforce. I actually usually start my uh, presentations with "It's the people, stupid," and um, I think often, particularly those of us who are providers or who work in the provider community, take the workforce for granted. Um, and to my mind, if we don't invest in our workforce, we actually cannot produce the quality that we are promising people. Uh, and furthermore, I think that our sector is going to be the future of jobs in this country for many communities. So an investment in the workforce is going to pay off in a number of different areas. I want to start by defining the sector that I'm talking about here. Um, 
because we have so many different aspects to the uh, long-term care, long-term services and supports, uh, aging services sector, however you want to use the, the, uh, the nomenclature. Um, it encompasses a huge amount and range of services and settings. So today I'm going to be speaking primarily to the sector that uh, refers to the post-acute skilled nursing facility and home health care world. Uh, residential care, which may include more long-stay nursing homes, assisted living, and a growing uh, amount of memory care, both units and uh, organizations and buildings themselves. Independent living, including both market rate and subsidized, and uh, increasingly we see that uh, many people want to remain in their own communities uh, and don't actually want to, nor do they per perhaps need to move to higher level levels of care. If we had the right workforce who was actually able to deliver the services, and I think this is the key, it is not just the financing, but it's actually how we deliver and whether people are trained and supported to do the work that they need to do. The whole area of home and community-based services, the expansion of home care, personal care, and also instrumental activities of daily living help. Supportive services are also uh, included within this sector, and that includes things like transportation, meals, and, um, and ancillary services that help people remain as healthy and as functionally able as possible for as long as possible. And finally, this whole new, and actually I put new in quotes because it's really not new, it's an evolution of care and service coordination across settings and linking the long-term care or LTSS sector with the acute and primary care. So more and more we are seeing that need to be deployed as connectors, as links, as uh, liaisons between settings and um, that is a growing area of both business development and also workforce development. So one of the things that I wanted to highlight about our jobs is that it's a really um, exciting and um, challenging area because it is a, such a multidisciplinary set of occupations. So it's not just the medical world, it's not just the social world, it's not just the physical and surrounding environment world. Our workforce really works at the intersection of these three. If you think, if you think about a Venn diagram um, with these three big areas, we actually touch all of those, which makes it in some ways, I think, incredibly challenging and exciting. It also makes it much more difficult than recruiting or retaining, for example, in uh, even other parts of the healthcare system, like a hospital or even a primary care practice or a clinic, which is pretty well defined, our sector is much more um, is much broader and much more uh, multidisciplinary, both in terms of the skills and competencies that are needed, the types of uh, staff that are employed, and the the knowledge and and competencies that people need to sort of wend their way through these different parts of the system that, that's going to get us to uh, person-centered and actually uh, work, workplace-centered uh, activities. And I want to underscore here that I think those of you who are greenhouse operators um, in more ways than one probably exemplify both the challenges of bringing these sectors together as well as uh, exemplifying elements of a healthy workplace model that I think we all ought to be trying to emulate, even if we are not developing greenhouses ourselves. So let's think a little bit about the vast range of, of job categories here. Um, of course, we have our clinicians. And in, uh, in this world, as opposed to, for example, in the um, broader healthcare world, the hospital and uh, primary care world, nurses and social workers are really the lead clinicians in our sector with physicians, um, at least until recently, playing a relatively minor role, um, I would say the role of a good quality medical director is very important in our sector, but also the connections and the liaison between our staff and, and the physicians, particularly the primary care physicians, 
that the people that we care for are also visiting, that, that connection is important. Um, but the, the drivers in terms of clinicians are, do not tend to be physicians, which is very different but for, from the rest of the healthcare system. The other, one of the other areas that is important and growing is certainly the areas of, in therapy, including not just physical therapy um, and speech therapy, but a growing, growing sector of occupational therapy, uh, which really is focusing on uh, function and livability in environments. Uh, and, and we see a lot more OT that's actually going into many, many settings, including more and more private homes and independent living. The pharmacist obviously is, criti is critical. Um, most of our people that we care for these days are being treated with multiple medications and the, the challenges of, of multi polypharmacology and the potential for a lot of harm and iatrogenic effects, um, as well as the potential role of pharmacists to help intervene and uh, allow us to make more judicious decisions about how drugs are used um, is really important. Dietitians, the whole nutrition area is incredibly important for our, um, for our consumers as well as for our workforce. Uh, we are not only looking at healthy meals and meal preparation, but also what are people eating and how important that is to their overall health and function. And then increasingly, as we see more and more of a focus on prevention, an early intervention, even with people who are very high risk, who we used to think could not benefit from uh, health education and earlier intervention, we're now seeing much more of a focus on exercise, Tai Chi, other kinds of wellness programs, as well as education around chronic, self, chronic disease self-management, um, and even sort of trying to figure out how we live our lives healthfully, even if we are uh, more at the end of life. But there's a lot of education that goes on these days in palliative care. So um, beside the clinicians, of course, we have a range of administrators and managers. Uh, these are key in our sector. We are a relatively flat organizations compared with other parts of the healthcare sector, like the hospitals, for example. We are relatively flat, and so our administrators and our managers are really key because we don't have as many of them and they they wear multiple hats and one of the things that I always talk about in terms of the the nature of these occupations are that often our our uh, management positions are looked on as sort of second tier that you know your gold star your gold the the, the holy grail is to become a an administrator in a uh, in a hospital or a health system and I would argue that the administrators and the managers in, in many of our settings is much more complex because they don't have as many staff to help out and they have to wear a lot of hats and they have to make a lot of decisions simultaneously. Now let me get to what I consider to be the most important occupations in our sector, um, what I call the frontline professionals who deliver about 60 to 80 percent of all the formal paid care in our settings. Um, some, some have referred to these folks as low-wage workers. I never use that term. I tend to use frontline professionals, uh, and these are professionals who unfortunately are often paid low wages. Um, so uh, these are the certified nursing assistants, the home health and home care aides, the personal care aides, the dietary aides, the folks who work in your nursing homes, in your assisted living, in home care. Um, who are the um, you, maybe the universal workers in your greenhouse environments and other small home environments. Um, but these are the significant players in our sector. Um, not only are they the most important in terms of being the frontline caregivers, but they are the eyes and the ears of our system. They are the relational people who have the close relationships with individuals and their families. Um, and I would argue, and more and more we're seeing empirical evidence to support this, that they make or break uh, the success of an organization. Families and friends, of course, are the ultimate in the caregivers. They are informal or in some cases in um, parts of the country where there is consumer-directed programs funded by Medicaid and sometimes state programs. Families are more and more being paid as 
paid caregivers. So they are primarily unpaid. Uh, some are growing in the formal market, but they are the major providers of service. And I think we always have to recognize that any type of striving for person-centered care, we have to recognize that this tends to be a dyad with the family and friends as part of the system and a very important part of that workforce that wouldn't work at all if we didn't have them available. So why do we need to care about this? Let's, let's think a little bit about the emerging care gap, um, which we are going to see in the future. Uh, we, are have, we are going to see an exponential growth, not only in the elderly population, but the 85 and over population, which is actually where we see the most demand for a lot of our services and why we need a quality and competent workforce. At the same time that we see this growth in the demo dem demographics of the elderly population, we have the potential in many parts of the country for a shortage of the workforce that actually is delivering care, particularly the frontline workforce, uh, also uh, the potential for shortages of nursing uh, and some of the other categories that are pretty essential for running our organizations and producing quality outcomes. Uh, and we also are expecting that in the next 20 years, just as we see this growth in the elderly population, we will see a decline in family caregivers available. And this is a number of reasons. One, the childlessness rate among uh, individuals has gone up substantially, so more people are going to be childless at the end of their lives. The um, more and more divorce, particularly uh, among middle-aged people, creates unsettling and unstable family support networks to provide care. And so this is going to put more pressure on a formal care system. And those of us who, who are in, on the webinar today who are running organizations may already be encountering workforce shortages uh, because of the good economy. Uh, ironically, one of the atrogenic effects of having gotten out of our recession and improving our economic situation in our local geographies is that there are more opportunities for particularly our frontline folks, but also our clinicians and our managers to go to other places to make even just a little bit more money. And so we are seeing uh, a lot, we are seeing retention problems. And then on top of that, we have recruitment problems. So um, this is an issue that I think is in the short term, uh, pro primarily a local economy issue, but I think in the long term, it's gonna be more systemic in terms of the elderly population outgrowing the population that should be there to care for us. And we're gonna think about, we're gonna to need to think about a pipeline. We also are going to have more ethnically and racially diverse older adults. We already have in many communities a very racially and ethnically diverse staff, but in the next 20 years, we will see tremendous growth in the Hispanic populations of older adults, as well as to a lesser extent, African-Americans and people from different uh, Asian backgrounds. And we will see more highly educated, demanding older adults. I'm a baby boomer. I'm part of that, those cohorts. Uh, and that, that education, higher education actually holds true across all SES categories. So even um, people in lower economic, economic strata, elderly people will be more highly educated on average than the current elderly, meaning that they will have more knowledge, but also be, have, be more health literate and be more demanding. And I think that if we add the technology and our access to Google and all kinds of information and the push towards more consumer involvement in, uh, in making decisions about their care, uh, our workforce is going to be facing a lot more demands than it is currently, which is a good and a, and a, and a challenge at the same time. Um, I, I, I wouldn't want to uh, talk about this without highlighting the fact that we are also going to see greater disparity between the haves and the have-nots, and that gap is growing, including it's growing among new cohorts of elderly. The young old, for example, the, the, the uh, current 65 to 75 year olders, olds look, look a lot worse economically than the older population, and as the baby boomer cohorts move through over the next 25 years, we're gonna have a growing group of folks who are either poor or near poor or in very, very low middle class um, and having very little access to uh, the dollars that are needed to actually purchase services. 
Um, the expansion of con consumer directed service systems, as I said, we are seeing a lot of that in the public system, uh, and that has implications for who is a worker, uh, how do families, how do individuals actually purchase care? Are they hiring people down the road? Um, you know, are they getting folks from registries? Are they hiring folks from just some of these new um, technology-based platforms? And what does that mean for the for the quality and the skill sets and the knowledge uh, of the folks who are going to be working in our environments? The real question is the impact of new technologies. Not a day goes by that I, that I don't see uh, articles and human interest stories about robots that are going to help and take over everything. Uh, I would argue that there's probably some really some truth to that, but I also think we will remain a fairly uh, robust human resourced environment, at least in the near future, with technologies more likely to support our workforce than to totally replace them. So why is this an important sector to just basically sort of get back to the basics? The growth of this population, our elderly population, is really creates some of the fastest growing jobs in many localities. The new models of care that we are seeing, value-based payments that are, that are pushing more and more people out into the community, into both post-acute and more long-term settings, whether it's in a residential care environment or in people's homes is creating new types of jobs in this sector. We are also an economic driver in many, many communities. And I would say that this is particularly true if any of you are in, on the webinar are from rural communities. The rural areas are already um, overrepresented with elderly uh, consumers. That's only going to grow in the future. Uh, and the opportunity for jobs and actually even keeping people in communities, we may be the only answers to those questions. And I think a lot of businesses and a lot of chambers of commerce uh, are interested in our sector because this is where the jobs will be. And finally, I would conclude with saying that we don't get to quality without a quality workforce. Quality does not happen magically. It does not happen with an electronic health record. It does not happen with with having financial uh, systems aligned. It only happens if we have people who are trained and supported to do quality work. So um, we need a quality workforce in order to produce the outcomes that we are promising people. So we have recruitment problems. We have retention challenges. And I would argue also that we have a lack of a competent quality staff. So this is not just about warm bodies. And this gets really problematic when we have shortages in our communities, because the first thing we want to do is just hire more people. And I would argue that we need to be paying as much to retention as we pay to recruitment, because we need to be, we need to be growing and keeping our quality staff. And if we do that, we would not have as much of a recruitment challenge, even though we're going to have that as well. Um, particularly facing us over the next 15 to 20 years. But retention is going to be really key for us. So before I get into some of the solutions, I just wanted to highlight, have, have us at least think about why are these so challenging? I would argue, and I, I'm assuming that everybody on this webinar is, I'm preaching to the choir here because we all are in this field and we love it. Um, but this is an undervalued sector. And it's undervalued across all of our occupations. So it's not just our frontline aides. It's also our, our nurses, our social workers, our managers, our CEOs. Um, no matter where you go in our, in our job categories, we tend to be lower paid than even our peers in other parts of the healthcare sector. And that makes it very, very difficult. I would argue that a lot of this stems from ageism that a lot of people just don't want to work with the elderly. Uh, it, is, uh, it has not been a sector that has necessarily been looked on as the first place that people would, would like to go, which leads to a lack of attention and investment. And we see this if you look at uh, how much we invest in the curriculum and the training of folks who go into our sector, as well as even looking at our Medicaid and Medicare reimbursement rates. Where they are inadequate, they are inadequate in large part because they don't, they are not sufficient to really cover good labor costs. 
And it really has an effect on what we can pay people and then ultimately how we attract people into our jobs. And finally, these jobs are seen as easy. There, you know, how many times have you heard a nurse say, and we've heard this even in the leading age members when I, when I go into some of our organizations that, oh, if you, you know, you really wouldn't want to work here as a nurse. Uh, and we've heard our own nurses say this. Um, these jobs are seen as easy or they are a default after burnout in another sector. At the same time, when you meet people who love the work that they're doing and recognize how difficult and challenging these jobs are, um, you get a whole other sense of the importance of the workforce in this sector. At the policy level, we have had a lot of challenges. I talked a little bit about this, but I think inadequate public reimbursement drives a lot of the uh, undervaluing of our sector, uh, the lack of a long-term services and support financing mechanism. If everybody had resources to actually be able to pay for the kind of services that we uh, offer in our settings, I think we would be farther along in terms of developing a quality workforce. Um, for many, Medicaid is viewed as a welfare program, which just adds to the negative view of our sector in general. We have very uneven regulation which I think unfortunately tends to focus more on the numbers of staff or on ratios and not as much on the quality of the workplace. Uh, taking the greenhouse model as an example, why aren't we looking at the attributes of a healthy workplace as a way to monitor quality and to pay for performance? For example, the state of Kansas right now in their peak program, they actually reimburse for higher quality for those nursing homes that have achieved higher culture change in their organizations. We need to have policies that actually incentivize our service systems to be investing and supporting a quality workplace. We have a lack of intentional educational policy in our arena. If you look at the curricula of any of our clinical programs, whether it's medicine, nursing, social work, therapy, very little attention to our sector. Uh, and certainly, if you look at the range of uh, programs, as well as training requirements and competencies for our direct care staff, um, it is tremendously varied across the country. And finally, I think one of the biggest challenges that we're facing right now is the future of immigration policy. Um, many of you may or may not know that a large proportion of our frontline professionals are actually immigrants. About a third of our home care workers and at least a quarter of folks who work in nursing homes are immigrants. They are foreign born, and many of them came to this country through family reunification. So in the debate that is going on right now on Capitol Hill, this immigration question is a big one because if we cut off family reunification, we are really cutting off an important pipeline for our sector. And uh, if we're not at least thinking about either advocacy or at least acknowledging the role of immigration, it's something that we need to be paying attention to. At the workplace level, which for many of you, I'm assuming you are providers, this is where we can really make a difference. And, and these are the kinds of things that we have seen that make a difference and that are challenging for us. The first is lack of quality supervisors. If we look at the major, any empirical uh, evidence, any studies that have been done, whether they're quantitative or qualitative, show the number one factor that determines why a workforce is unhappy and why they leave their jobs. While they may be leaving for a, a little, a few dollars more, they're leaving uh, most of the time because they have poor quality supervisors who are not supporting them. They are not getting the respect they are not included in self-managed work teams. Um, it is, they are, the supervisors are not creating a healthy workplace. And, and that's why in, in our work, we encourage so much of the uh, intervention around developing quality supervisors because that is a key variable. Um, the second thing that we find in, among our staff, whether it's frontline or other levels of staff, is that there is terrible inadequate in-service training for our workforce, which us as providers have some responsibility in. We are the ones who determine what kind of in-service people are receiving, how they are receiving it, what is the modality, are the, are the topics relevant, are they helping our staff to grow and learn, and then do they have the opportunities to actually take what they learn and put it into practice. 
The third is the lack of career mobility. This is another thing that we see, and it is a struggle for our sector because, as I said previously, we are a relatively flat sector, so we don't have a lot of opportunities for growth within one organization, but that means we have to be more creative. Are we creating career lattices for our staff? Can people become spe specialists, for example, in dementia care or in health education or in supervising other staff? I think, um, and, and I think the Greenhouse has done a great job in this with the universal worker activity around really managing an entire household and thinking about um, ways of creating career mobility where folks can become mentors and then leaders of groups and teams. Uh, we have to do a lot more around career mobility. And let me just give you one tip, and that is not all frontline professionals want to become nurses. We need to think about other avenues for career development, and that includes avenues for career development for our mid-level managers as well. The, the next area, of course, is inadequate compensation and benefits. And, and all I can say is, is that we need to be competitive. And I, I often hear, even from our organizations at Leading Age, we are all nonprofit. There should be enough room in, in our budgets to pay a, a living wage. But if there isn't, we have to sort of figure out how we redistribute our own dollars. Um, we may have to take uh, money away from C-suite people and actually move it more into frontline and direct supervisors because you're going to get your biggest bang for your buck in terms of investing in your frontline staff. And finally, our sector is not competitive technologically. We certainly are not competitive when it comes to hospitals or even primary care. And I can tell you that millennials are looking for jobs that are technologically advanced. Uh, and we need to be places where people can use their skills and develop them even more so. And right now, I think we're behind the curve on that. So what are the policy solutions here? So I don't know how many of you are policy people. I'm assuming most of you are providers. But providers can get engaged with policy as well. We all need to be advocating for tying Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement directly to workforce development. These dollars need to be used. They need to be thought of as how adequate is our reimbursement for actually paying our staff. Um, that is the key a driver of how we're going to support a quality workforce, both in terms of compensation and benefits, as well as the kind of training that we need to do for our staff. We should be thinking about, and this is not just um, at the policy sort of survey and regulatory level, but also at the workplace level, how do we include workforce indicators in quality measures that are real, that are not just ratios or numbers, but actually have indicators that relate to a high-performing workplace? I would love to see us do some advocacy around targeting um, GME dollars, which is basically the Medicare dollars that currently go to supporting training doctors in academic health centers. This is Medicare money. Why aren't we actually talking about getting a fraction of those dollars, which is in the billions now, in, in order to actually support the development of our workforce, as well as other federal and state dollars that could go into our sector specifically? We need to be thinking about how we support investment in these jobs in worker shortage and disadvantaged communities. Uh, can we develop some type of a, of a, of a core, a national core? Um, perhaps we've had discussions here at Leading Age about thinking about loan forgiveness for students who actually go and work in our sector for two or three years and then get uh, some of their uh, loan forgiven uh, as they finish their, um, their education. And then thinking about using immigration policy to target the folks who, are, who we need for our sector. How can we think about good policies, good immigration policy that allows us to bring in folks who are going to uh, add to the pipeline, both on the frontline professionals, but also in areas like nursing, uh, social work, uh, and other, other types of areas where we might see shortages. And finally, I would say on the policy side, we need to be pushing very, very strongly at our, at our state levels for delegation, but nurse delegation and delegation in other, uh, in other professions where frontline workers could be doing a lot more with good supervision if we had the delegation authority 
to allow that to happen. On the educational side, we've got to develop the faculty to train our staff and the curricula that focuses not generically on healthcare, but specifically on the sectors that we work in, which are very, very different, more complicated, and have a lot of different nuances that need to be addressed. But one of the things that we hear a lot at Leading Age is that even if we had good curricula, we don't have the faculty to train. So we need to think about how do we develop the faculty. One of the things that we need to be doing, and I would suggest that if any of you who are a greenhouse provider or any other provider out there in the community, that you think about yourself as a quality clinical and management placement. These students need their great quality placements in our organizations in order to get attracted to our sector. If they have a crummy placement coming out of school, they will never be attracted. And yet we do not have a lot of organizations stepping up to the plate to become exemplars for clinical and management uh, practice positions. We have to think about expanding career ladder opportunities. I'd like to take advantage much more of our apprenticeship programs in this country. And the problem is, is that our wages are so low that we often don't even qualify for apprenticeship. So we as employers need to think about how do we become places where people can learn on the job and grow on the job. And then we need to reframe programs for displaced or older workers who may be looking for second or third careers and may have an opportunity for working in our sector well into their 70s. Right now, the average age of a, of a home care worker is somewhere around 45. Uh, we have a lot of that workforce that is over 50. And I think the potential for older workers in this sector has been greatly underestimated. If we had the right kinds of training and supports to, uh, to allow that to happen. In our workplace solutions, I think that we need to become employers of choice, which means that we have to be able to demonstrate that we have good supervision, that we have good orientation and good training programs that are in service and ongoing that we actually develop career ladder opportunities or lattice opportunities within our organizations, that we grow our own as well as recognize that sometimes when we grow our staff, they're going to leave, but they're actually still going to be contributing to our sector. I would say that we need to think about some type of Maltham Baldrige program for this sector, which actually helps us go through the, the, the levels of becoming a high performer and then getting rewarded for it. Um, we have to take the initiative in developing innovative career ladders and lattices, and we have to support quality management and supervision. Um, I, I, will, I would say, say to you that one of the places that you can look for some of these best practices is to go to our website at www.leadingage.org and take a, take a look at our new Workforce Solutions Center. We have a new whole part on our, on our website that actually provides a whole array of best practices and solutions for, um, for making our places better places to work. We are growing that best practice area by um, every day, and uh, we welcome any solutions that you might have that we could add to these promising practices. Um, and here you can see that in the center we've got uh, the workforce crisis laid out, promising practices. We're developing a whole set of tools, um, including a turnover calculator so that you can at least begin to understand um, what your turnover looks like now, um, how you can improve it, how you can actually work, how you can partner with community colleges and other organizations in your community um, to better develop your staff. Um, so we're growing that um, quite a bit. We're adding podcasts all the time from um, ex experts and folks in the field who are um, trying to develop a quality workplace. So um, please take advantage of this um, website and help us grow it. It is open to the public. It is not just open to leading age members. So with that, I am going to... Uh, to conclude, I think we've got about 15 minutes. Um, before I get to any questions that we might have, uh, I do want to say that um, I was really happy when Susan asked me to do this because I 
believe quite strongly uh, that the greenhouse model is not the only answer to a healthy workplace, but it is one of the avenues for creating a more healthy workplace. And interestingly enough, I think there is a lot to learn from greenhouse in terms of how the work has been structured because so many of the elements of greenhouse is actually what you would want to put in place in any organization. Um, you know, I often tell people that, you know, you don't necessarily have to build a greenhouse in the same exact way, but many of the attributes around person-centered care and a, and a, and a staff-centered care, which is what's so critical about this. It's not just the person. Remember, in, in most of our situations, our staff are working in people's homes as well as they are workers, they are, they are workers themselves. And the opportunities to create a healthy workplace are tremendous. Uh, and I think we need to emulate the models that are out there um, that are not just physical changes uh, and are not just focused on residents or, or consumers, but are also focused on the, on the staff who, again, as I said, if we don't invest in our staff, uh, we can't possibly achieve the, the goals that we have set for ourselves. So um, why don't I stop? Uh, I don't know, uh, Susan, if there's any questions. Um, you know, I could probably keep going on and on and on, but I'd like to get some <laughs> feedback from the, from the audience. So I don't see a lot of anything in the chat box, for sure. It looks like we might have something in our questions uh, box. And it looks like it's more specific to Greenhouse, which I can answer in a, a moment. But let me just um, ask you, Robin, because I, I heard you talk a little bit about um, what Kansas, the state of Kansas, is doing to incentivize yeah for yes. it sounds like uh, quality and workforce. So yes. is that the only state that you have seen that is really doing something that creative and really incentivizing what they want to see with regard to workforce? I, I mean, there are a number of other states. I mean, Minnesota, for example, has had quality bonuses for uh, workplace improvements. What, what's interesting about Kansas is that it's, it's called the PEAK program. It has been specifically targeted to culture change efforts. And um, without going into um, gory details, there are four levels of culture change that are identified uh, and a very sort of clear roadmap for what you need to be, be doing to achieve each level um, from you know, very early adoption of uh, principles of person-centered care already to a full-blown culture change activity where the physical environment has changed, the workplace has changed, um, you know, everything sort of is in order. Uh, and um, the, organ the, the, the PEAK program is actually um, supported by the state and it is, oper it is implemented by Kansas State, some folks in the Aging Institute there. And, and what's nice about it is, is that they go every year and they actually do an assessment of organizations. And so they, they can identify which level the nursing, this is all for nursing homes at, at this point. They can mm -hmm. identify the, the level of culture change that the nursing home has achieved. And those nursing homes receive a, a, an increased Medicaid reimbursement depending upon what level that they have achieved. We actually, because they have had such good data, we've actually been able to link those data back to uh, quality indicators and outcomes. And a number wow. of things that we found, we just finished an evaluation of this program and we actually have several articles that have been published on PEAK. Um, but some of the most important findings are number one is that the PEAK program has actually encouraged for-profit nursing homes as well as nonprofit nursing homes to adopt culture change. Because some people have argued that this is only happening in very high-end nonprofit organizations. And in Kansas, you see that it has actually been uh, applied across a full range of nonprofit and for-profit providers. In addition to that, we have seen that the levels of culture change actually affect quality outcomes. There is mm. a strong effect, affecting everything from pressure ulcers to depression. 
So um, it's, it's really the first study that actually has looked at levels of culture change and effects on quality. So we are really strongly advocating that there should be a way of thinking about it, uh, how do we pay for quality uh, and how do we build that into particularly our Medicaid reimbursement. And I think Kansas is a good, is a good state to look at in terms of a model. Absolutely. Well, I've got a few more questions that uh, have come in in our box. Uh, the okay. first, from what you know, what is the average hourly rate for uh, care aids? Do you, is there an yeah. average across the country from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, the average hourly rate for right now for, a, a, you know, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me. I just actually did a, a presentation on this. Um, Last week, I think it's somewhere over over twelve dollars, and the average for a home care aide is about ten fifteen. Um, these are very very low wages, Absolutely. and they range. I mean, right. uh, you know, if you're an aide in New York City, you're getting um, substantially higher wages. Some of that has to do with um, just the cost of living in New York. It also, though, has to do with the fact, in this case, that the unions in New York have been extremely uh, aggressive at, at helping to, to get those wages up for, for workers. But across the country, it's, um, it's pretty much of an abomination, I think. Mm. If, right. If you I would think about it. Yeah, we have a, we have a large proportion of aides, uh, who actually are living on public benefits and, uh, up to a third, depending on the, where we, where you are in the country who are actually on Medicaid. So um, wow. it is a, it is a, th these are truly the working poor in many cases. For sure. Uh, here's another one. Is the industry exploring affordable on-site housing for staff? That is a great question. Um, we certainly have had, uh, we, we have actually had some proposals here at Leading Age uh, partly, you may, some of you who are in the uh, in the audience may know that Leading Age represents um, a full continuum of service providers, including a very large swath of low uh, affordable housing properties. So we actually have had some advocacy work that we have done around um, trying to think about how we build affordable housing for the workforce and how we collate affordable co-locate affordable housing. I, I know of some examples of this that are going on in California, um, particularly because the uh, housing is so darn expensive there and it is really difficult right. um, to, to get people to actually be able to live um, relatively close to where they work. Um, so it is something that is being talked about. Um, I think it's a lot more talk than it is reality at this point, but I think there is growing recognition. Hmm. All right. What about any efforts to educate high school students to enter our field? Yes, there are a lot of uh, examples of this. And in fact, one of the best practices that you will see on our website is a K through 12 program that is in Dayton, Ohio, where um, the Dayton, um, the Dayton, actually the Dayton system, the organizations of a coalition actually identified a number of sectoral of, uh, efforts to get grow jobs in Dayton, Ohio. One of them was the aging services slash healthcare sector. And as part of that, they have a very ambitious program to actually introduce aging services jobs to kids as young as kindergarten. And they're starting wow. with uh, using the ABCs and linking each letter to a job in our sector. It's actually a really, really interesting program. Um, we have identified it on our website as a promising practice. We're also considering actually doing some advocacy with the education department uh, in, at the national level and thinking about some other communities who could adopt this program. We also have a lot of providers who are working very closely with high schools um, who have actually developed programs where high school students come in and learn on the job and then stay and actually are employed once they graduate. Um, I am on the board of an organization here in the D.C. area that actually has a program right now with uh, Gaithersburg High School 
where um, mm. CNAs and home care aides are being trained and then are actually being are working in um, in a couple of our CCRCs in this area. So um, there are a lot of examples. Um, I wish they were more normative than they are one-offs mm -hmm. uh, because I think we have a lot of opportunity to grow, uh, you know, young kids and high school students and move them into our sector. Absolutely. Here's one uh, from Capitol Hill Village. They want to know how villages can support advocacy on the local level. I think that's a great question. Um, as I said, I think, you know, the village movement, um, the village has a great role to play, first of all, because you are um, you are a, 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 a natural um, community that has a vested interest in helping to support and um, and call for a, a quality workforce in our arena. First, you stand to benefit from it, I think, both in terms of how you use volunteers and how you actually might be able to even think about employing a more formal workforce if we were able to get the economies of scale of the village model to actually get a workforce to work across villages. Um, so my first thought, of course, is, is that you become a voice um, for the, um, the investment at the local level in growing this workforce. And it's everything from investment in education, investment in um, in training, investment in thinking about this sector as a place that we actually could have people come in. As I said, a loan forgiveness programs where if folks, young folks were actually getting an education and were able to have some loan forgiveness around their education in, in, in exchange for working, maybe working in the village, maybe working with the village and some surrounding providers. Uh, I think there's just great opportunity at the local level to be advocating for um, for for workforce investment, and I think it is to the benefit of of the villages themselves. That's great. Um, what about community college? Somebody says, how can I get my community college connected to support this issue? Yeah, I mean, we are trying here at the at the national level uh, to actually work with the National Association of Community Colleges to get them more engaged. And, and as some of you may know, depending on the community that you live in, community colleges are some of the major uh, providers of education for our workforce, both our, our frontline professionals as well as other professions, including nursing, uh, social work, and even some of the associate degrees in um, in management, um, but I think we need a, a stronger voice in terms of, again, making this less of one example here and one example there to making it um, a strong normative movement where every single community college has not only uh, good faculty and um, opportunities for um, good curricula, but also um, there is a lot of interest in, for example, folks going into community college and then being able to use some of those credits and move them into four-year colleges down the road. And if we think about it, we could have the providers working with the community colleges and then working with um, higher schools of education to think about career ladders developed that way. I think there's room for every single one of the providers in communities to get their community colleges, if they're not engaged, to get them engaged. And the most, the most, the best way to do it is actually to invite them in and have them see what the potential is for job development in this area. Because I think these are areas that these jobs are going to grow, whether it's health coaches, um, whether it's wellness trainers, um, whether it's we're, our staff who are going to be doing more and more on the IT side, so have room for developing the technology aspects, whether it's culinary education where folks are learning to be chefs or developing nutrition, diet, dietitian backgrounds. There are so many areas where the community colleges could be a great partner with, with our sector. Mm, that's great. And how to help rural assisted living areas become community resources. How can we yeah. help them create better policies to retain staff? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I again, because I'm a, um, I work at Leading Age, I spend a lot of time in 
many of our rural, uh, both with our rural state associations and, and some of our providers. Last year, I was out in Nebraska and in Kansas and in Missouri and uh, in Montana and, um, and, and parts of rural PA. Um, and I see this issue, I mean, happen to be down in St. Mary's County in Maryland uh, two weeks ago where we have a fabulous uh, organization that is really struggling in many ways to figure out what they're going to be in the, in the future and how do they become a resource for the community. Uh, you know, I think the, 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 um, while, it, it, while it's a challenge, it also can become an opportunity because in many cases, our organizations are some of the only providers in the community, and we have the opportunity to provide jobs. So, you know, and, and we tend to, rural, rural providers tend to be in overly elderly communities. So the question is, how do we hook up with the other stakeholders in communities so that they see us as a, as a resource for job creation, for becoming a hub for training and education and good placements. Um, I think we have a really strong role to play in communities. And in actually, as, as, as Dayton tried to do, which is not rural, but it is a very, un, very depressed city, trying to think about how they use their providers and this sector as a way to develop jobs to keep people in, in the community. And that, I think, is what these rural communities need. Mm -hmm. That's great. What are key technologies that need to be updated by providers? What are key technologies? Well, I think, first of all, we need to have um, at least uh, electronic health systems and electronic systems that are up to date and that allow our staff to be fully engaged and use the skill sets that they have. Um, for example, I've been told in many cases that the uh, the new the frontline workers who come in are are told to keep their uh, phones leave their phones at the door, and because they don't want them playing games or texting their friends or what have you. Um, if you do that, you're basically cutting off the appendages of these young people who where this has just become a part of their life. I think we need to be thinking about how we use the technologies that folks bring to the job, how we build that into their jobs, how do we build that into mm. how they document care, um, how they share information, um, you know, how they um, do judicious decision making. So one thing is for us to, to just to use the technologies that people are bringing in. Um, the other is I think that, that we need to have very strong technology and data systems. We are not as, as strong in terms of um, data access and, um, and, and data interoperability as many other parts of our sector. And I think people are not going to be attracted in the future without that. Wow, that's great. So I, I'm looking at the time. I'm going to, I've got probably four or five questions left and I'm trying to figure out which one to uh, give you. But let me just uh, get the most recent. What are the most voiced reasons that people remain over long periods as practitioners in this sector? The number one voiced reason for staying is they love the people they care for. So, you know, I mean, the, the, the stayers um, are overwhelmingly uh, committed to the people that they care for. That is the number one uh, reason that people stay. And so it, it shows you that we do have, I think, a very caring and committed workforce because those are the folks who stay. But the other reason has to do with supervisors, that if there, if there is not a supportive work environment and particularly that uh, frontline first level supervisor and supervisory environment that allows people to be empowered that delegates responsibility to them so that they can not only achieve but thrive, people are going to leave. And, and we see that at all levels. So it's not just frontline, it's across all levels. And I think it's one of the challenges for our organizations is to figure out how do we create exciting opportunities and how do we allow people to practice to the highest level of their skills and competencies. 
Oh, Robin, I can't believe we're at the top of the hour. I think the, the hour went so quickly. And I think for me, I feel like we've just scratched the surface. And um, I'd actually love to um, invite you back for kind of a follow-up at some point, And we can do maybe a deeper dive into some of these areas and strategies. And um, I think there's just a lot to mine and a lot to learn. And I think uh, I want to just echo something Robin mentioned, and that was referencing the leading age website uh, on workforce. I took a look at it. I've taken a look at it a couple of times, but uh, went there today before the webinar, and it is loaded with some great resources. So thank you, Robin. It has been an absolute sure. joy to have you today. I've learned a lot, and I'm sure that our attendees did as well. Um, just want to have everyone take note of upcoming webinars where we will continue our series of webinars. Dr. Al Power kicks off our dementia series on March 22nd. On April 11, we do a follow-up on the Making the Business case, and uh, then we're going to do a follow-up on this workforce uh, sometime in April. Thank you, everyone, for your time, for your attention. Again, Robin, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thanks, Susan, and thanks to everybody. Bye-bye. All right. Have a great afternoon.